Hi, my name's Eric Anzalone, and this is What Matters Most. We're outside the Recording and Rehearsal Arts Building here in the heart of New York City on 30th Street, right in the middle. And if you listen closely, you can hear the heartbeat of the Big Apple. Oh! Relaxing, isn't it? But thankfully, we're here today to visit with Grammy Award-winning producer and sound healer Barry Goldstein. Barry, Barry is a translator of sacred sound and inspirational song, and his passion is to share his music with the world. He refers to his music as the universal language of love. And indeed, it is global, being used in hospitals, hospices, wellness centers, and personal practices around the world. So let's go inside and talk to Barry. So as I said, Barry Goldstein is a Grammy award-winning producer. In 2005, he won a Grammy for Best Rock Instrumental with Les Paul. Ah! He's created ambient music for the likes of Shirley MacLaine, opened up and shared space with best-selling authors and personalities like Wayne Dyer, James Van Praag, Marianne Williamson, Neil Donald Walsh. He's a film composer, and his work has been featured on television, NBC, ABC, Fox, Lifetime Networks. Uh, he's produced music for EMI, Polygram, Atlantic, BMG, and a lot of other major record labels. And if that wasn't enough, deep breath, uh, he hosts a radio show on the World Puja Network, uh, writes articles for Mystic Pop and Planet Lightworker magazines, facilitates worldwide workshops on sound healing, and, and in all caps, performs concerts internationally touching people with his music from the heart. Barry, what a pleasure. My pleasure. How are you, Eric? I'm um, fantastic, fantastic. So when you were a kid, did you have like a kiki d moment like i got the music in me or you know or did did you have to go find the music uh well my house growing up we had a baby grand piano mm -hmm. and i would kind of tinker around my mom said it was at about two years old i was kind of tinkering around on the piano and kind of a musical family played by they played by ear my sister was much more trained uh, musically than i was but mm -hmm. i think that i always had a, a knowing that music was something that I was going to do from a from a pretty early age. Yeah. How, how old were you when you started writing? Uh, I started writing when I learned my first three chords on a guitar. Which 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 were the chords? When I don't remember. Probably the same ones we're gonna <laughs> be playing later. <laughs> CFG probably. Right. But uh, no, actually it wasn't F because I remember crying when I first right. got the F chord. Yeah, right. it was pretty hard. But yeah, um, writing was always a thing for me, even more so than covering other people's songs. I, writing, as soon as I learned how to play, it was always about writing and expressing through mm. music. Yeah. And how did you then move into the music industry? I started uh, taking those songs and I got a four track recorder during college and started doing little recordings of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it kind of progressed when I got out of college. I realized that it took a lot more time for me to communicate mm -hmm. to engineers and producers what I was hearing. Yeah. So I, I started producing and getting more into the technology to right. support that. And I got, so. I mean, come on. Les Paul. Les Paul, people who don't know this, he is rock and roll. It's, it's, there wouldn't be rock and roll without him. He is the inventor, the creator of the solid body uh, electric guitar, like over here, this Les Paul Gibson. And he, 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 it's not just guitar, he was an innovator in oh, yeah. sound, reverb, delay, uh, uh, multi track recording. Multi track recording. Like, yeah. I mean, we would not be recording the way we do. No, this day without Les I mean, Paul, yeah. a, a, in the in the um, uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, there's like a shrine to the guy. Seriously, I mean, th that's how important he is. And you, you worked with him. I did. I mean, I got the uh, had the blessing of of working with him through a lot of synchronicities um, for before the record came out. But you know, we're talking about the first guitar and all of that. You know, when when I was about 15 years old, we were going to buy an, an electric guitar. And we, you know, we could afford like a, a Stratocaster, you know, in that two hundred dollar range, and uh, we were just about to buy it. And the uh, the salesperson saw that my my dad was going to buy a guitar, and he came out yeah. with this the Gibson Les Paul that is actually behind you. Right. That that was yeah. there. Yeah. And uh, you know, my father put out three credit cards, and you know, 
took out a uh, French horn that my sister never played, and he made me promise, um, you know, at that time, he said, if I buy this for you, you have to promise me that you're going to stick with music because, you know, we can't really afford this. And so I did. I made him that promise. Yeah. And I, I believe that kind of planted the seeds for uh, almost 30 years exactly to the, to the date when that guitar was bought. I was 44 years old when Les got nominated for 69 Freedom Special. Oh, correct. And so, yeah, it was, you know, 30 years later after looking at that guitar, I don't know how many times and seeing the name Les Paul. Uh, that I had the privilege of, of working with him and playing with him live on what, stage. What did, well. what did your dad so, think? About that? You know, my dad, I don't know if he fully got it, you know? <laughs> yeah. But because uh, actually, uh, it was about a week after the, the whole Grammy thing, and on the phone conversation, he said, Have you ever thought about becoming a wedding singer? Oh, no. <laughs> It's like, uh, okay, so <laughs> I said, Dad, yeah. then, you know, the part of you that just wants to, you know, get yeah. that recognition from Dad, and I just held back and said, you know, it's okay, man. He got me the guitar. I, you know, he, uh, he in, anchored me into really committing to being music, and that was really the gift. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, um, your, your dad was or is agnostic? My dad was a devil's advocate all the way around. So it was part of his love was questioning, which is, you know, that's that's great because it makes you, you know, it makes you learn more when you're when you're questioning things. Right. And so. your awakening, if you call it that your awakening or when you had that spark? Yes. That For me, again because it's like ancestral we're, we're passed on our belief systems you know mm -hmm. i thought i was agnostic right. as well correct that's and i was actually coming uh, from upstate new york from from fishkill new york on the metro north taking a nap you know and it was really simple i woke up and the sun was going down over uh, the the hudson river and it was like you know we've all seen it like in film the spark hitting the the lake and mm -hmm. that castle that for those new yorkers who go on metro north and it was just like this moment where it was a knowing that kind of came through me that that I believed in something more than you know than my agnostic beliefs that there was something outside of myself and I heard the three words which was God is love and many years later uh, you know I, I studied a lot of different philosophies and Edgar Cayce um, sure. had utilized that term many times uh, of God is love but for me I think um, you know, when we when we start to tap into our spiritual, our our essence of spirituality, spirit meets us halfway where we're at. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's where I was at was keep it simple, and maybe I can embark on this journey. Mm -hmm. And that seemed very simple to me. God is love. It's like wow, if I could keep it that simple, uh, then I then I think that I I would love to learn more about it and embark mm -hmm. upon a journey that was much deeper than I had up until that point. And did you so. immediately make a connection between music and this epiphany you had? No, not really. I mean, it just opened up this whole other thing for me. It's like, mm -hmm. oh my God, now that I do believe this, okay, what do I do with that? You know, so like anything else, you know, mm -hmm. you start researching, right? Mm -hmm. And you start kind of tapping into, well, let me see what books are out there on this stuff and like reading the Celestine Prophecy like was one of the first things I read and then conversations with God and you know uh, much different than formalized religion but still really wanting to tap into that connection you know between our physical bodies and the, and the body outside of ourselves of, of creator or creation. And you explored the nature of music right the essence the vibrations the, the whole tones everything and how did you get started in that? Well, um, for me, you know, at that point, I had been in the music business for, for a while. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what a lot of people don't know about creating a pop song, and you probably do, you know, with your background as well, that a pop song is not created in four minutes, you no. know. So for me to create something that I'm proud of, you know, it's usually between 50 to 100 hours of studio time. Oh, yeah. Easy, right? Yeah. You know, oh, to oh, absolutely. Yeah, to create that, that sound that we're all looking for. So for me, it started to become work. You know, mm -hmm. working with labels and deadlines and commitments and all of that. And it's like I was losing kind of track of why I got into it. You know, that, that kid sitting on his bed playing three, three chords and writing. You know, so I decided that I really wanted to take a journey and take a step back from it and then combine, you know, some of my spiritual views that were developing at that time um, and bring them into music. So I decided that instead of composing music, I was going to um, kind of decompose, 
including decomposing, yeah. you know, myself as well. And I started to uh, just play keyboards and, and really just, I created my own sounds that were very ambient in nature. And I did some research and I knew that for me, it was about coming back to my heart. You know, what sparked my heart to be in music in the first place. So I, I wanted to reconnect with that space, you know, mm -hmm. that the Native American Indians talk about, you know, the longest journey we'll ever take is from the mind to the heart. And so I decided to do some research and I found out that um, the tempo of music really can alter our journey within the process, you know, how we entrain to a specific tempo. And the heart at a relaxed state is at about 60 beats per minute. So I started taking these hour-long journeys, setting my, my clock to 60 beats per minute. And it was really just allowing the music to come through, as opposed to me thinking about, oh, there's going to be a C chord here, an F chord here. It's kind of free falling and just kind of... You know, just like allowing space to come through. That that pulse, how, do you know how many beats per minute? That it's 60 beats per minute. See, yeah, yeah. You so know, I have it set up that, that way. So, you know, when we're doing this, people can kind of tap into that. And even just holding sustain, you know, has an effect because now there's harmonies over it. You know, so. something, a light bulb went off in my head when you were just talking about that because the heart, you know, music is all about rhythm and vibration. And we, we're not always aware of it, but we are in tune with, when we check somebody for a sign of life, we're, we're feeling for a pulse, mm -hmm. for a, a rhythm, for a vibration. And 60 beats per minute, right, a, a, a resting normal heart rate, although some of us might right. be more like 80. Right, but, right. Um, you know, that, that we're in tune to that so that it's speaking to us even though we don't know it, but we, we're used to that. We can shift environment, yeah. you know, just by doing that. You could play that in a room without even listening to it, and it can shift the environment, you know, people using it for, in negotiations, uh, in all types, types of situations in hospitals. Yeah. Um, I didn't think anyone would listen to these, like, hour-long pieces, mm -hmm. you know, with virtually no melody to them. And I got encouraged by friends who were massage therapists, you know, to get, to get it out there. Okay, so and perfect segue into uh, your series, Ambiology. Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, you were literally bridging the gap between science and, and healing and music. And what I love is, when I, look at, when I look at them, the heart, the breath, journey, home, Eden, and Genesis, Genesis is the beginning of mm -hmm. everything, and that's at the end. Right. You, you start with the heart, right. which mm -hmm. I would see, me, my brain, I think, oh, it goes the other way. But you go from here back to the beginning. For me, it's always that cycle of, you know, birth, right? And then things shedding different layers of ourselves and rebirthing, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a constant cycle and, and we see it so often, you know, and, you know, as people get older too, as they get closer to transitioning, they start moving back to the, those essences of a child again, mm -hmm. you know? So it's a constant Evolution, but for me, in in terms of doing the series, it wasn't uh, it wasn't as thought out as that. In real, in reality, um, there was a major intention for the series, which was that uh, for each person that listened to it, starting with me, okay, that it served that that they received the highest capacity of healing that they were open to, because you can't you know say to someone, oh, this is going to heal you, right? And it comes into also defining what is healing anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, for me. When we think about healing in our culture, we think about the physical body. But in reality, with music, it's, it's, it's usually more geared towards the emotional, spiritual, and mental bodies. Mm -hmm. You know, music triggers an emotion, right? And then we have this release, right, where it's like, wow, I don't know why, but I was like crying during that song, and I feel like lighter, you know? I haven't been able to, you know, release that since, you know, my dad passed or since my sister got sick. So is that a healing? Right, and for me, yeah, I would argue it is too. Yeah. So anytime we can release a block, you know, then, then I always feel like healing occurs. Okay. So then I'm guessing then the first part, the heart, mm -hmm. 60 beats per minute, right? All mm -hmm. through, the, and then the breath. Uh, what was your? How do you 
getting to the breath. I mean, there's no beats per minute for breath, is there, or is there? Uh, sure there is, yeah. Oh, there is? I mean, well, if you're breathing and you're tapped into oh, that 60 is. beats per minute, you're you know. Right. But, you know, the, the thing for me is, and we talked a, a little bit about this, you know, when, when we did your attunement, right? right, was that the thing that ties us all together is the essence of the heart and mm -hmm. the essence of the breath. Mm -hmm. You know, what do we come into our physical bodies with, right? When we're first, we're born, the first thing that we hear is our heartbeat and our breath. And actually, are the last sense that we have, okay, before we transition, is our hearing is the last sense that goes. So the last thing that we hear is our heartbeat and our breath. So that is what ties us together while we're here, is we all have a heartbeat, we all have a breath. So it makes sense that those would be the first two things that were, were kind of approached. It's, that's great. So then Genesis, what, what, what's at the end of this journey here with Genesis? What was your... Well, Genesis was pretty cool because at that point I had started really getting more uh, into discovering that the music had effect on our chakras, had effect on our bodies, and we had started getting testimonials from people of different ways that they, mm -hmm. they were using them, uh, which was interesting because I never said, well, this CD will be great for sleep. This one will be great for this. It was all based on testimonials that we received over a 10-year period of repetitive things, people telling us, wow, you use this for sleep all the time. Well, what, you know. what are some of the testimonials you got? Um, like for Genesis. Genesis okay. is like the one that is being used for sleeping challenges. I, um, it, it doesn't have a lot of melody in it, mm -hmm. um, and so I think before you go to sleep, mm -hmm. um, it's you don't want to connect to a lot of melody. You don't want uh, anything that's going to be distracting. So that's why it really works well with that. And Genesis, um, I started utilizing tuning forks in the pieces. So there's a fork in there called the Genesis fork that actually has a frequency of 531 hertz. Uh, what note is that? It's it's very close to a C. Yeah, but not not exactly. So that was implemented in the in the track at a very low level, um, and a lot of people who are doing uh, working with healing modalities or working with sleeping challenges are using utilizing Genesis in that way. So when you tuned my chakras, what, what do you call it? Or, uh, yeah, that's an right. attunement. Um, it was it really was. I mean, it was amazing. Okay, so just breathe that in. It was just a, a wonderful feeling of of being in tune, mm -hmm. and we were talking about uh, like a guitar is in tune, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, it, it will you you keep it in tune by playing it, mm -hmm. absolutely. And if you take the guitar into another room, it's got different moisture, different. It, it may go out of tune, but you you have to bring it back into tune, and that's absolutely. kind of what the idea is with the tuning forks and the chakras, correct? Absolutely, and that's a, that's a great analogy too, right. even moving into another room, because we're constantly shifting environment. You could start out your day perfectly centered, and then you know, if you're working with clients or even walking outside of New York, you're shifting your environment, and anything can take you out of tune slightly. So it is very much like a guitar, where you can have five strings in tune, but that one string could be out, mm -hmm. right? And you try to play a chord with that, how does it sound? dissonant, right? Yeah. And it's the same thing. When one chakra goes out, you know, it's like your spine, your regular spine going out. This is your energetic flow that supplies energy to the physical body. Cool. So this okay, is so now the solar in, plexus, which is your upper abdomen area. It's usually about two fingers above your belly button. So that is basically the spine at the top of that. And big breath in. Having the chakras in balance in balance allows us to stay more centered when we shift environments, right? Mm -hmm. We can come back to our center, you know, which I view our center as our heart. Yeah. So. And what your 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 work is uh, being used at the Monroe Institute? Yeah, they utilize a technology called HemiSync, and it works with what's called binaural beats. And binaural beats are basically different frequencies that are in the left ear and in the right ear. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it works with balancing the left and right hemispheres of the brain. So Monroe's work is very much geared towards brain frequencies. And as you can see, like in our discussion, uh, most of my work is geared towards the heart. Mm -hmm. So Monroe approached me to utilize my series Ambiology and take 10 minutes from each one of those and kind of create a journey with HemiSync that would allow people to kind of incorporate both. 
you know, the wisdom of the mind and the wisdom of the heart and, and find a balance with that. So you have a new CD. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this. It's called uh, Shine. It's very significant, you know, the front cover of it, you know, because it's a picture of me as a four-year-old. Really what it's about is we're in a place where, in our consciousness now, where we're, we're all about tapping into our giftedness. What, is, what are each one of us here to do? Right? And I believe that as a four-year-old, we probably know more back then than we do as we get older in terms of that call. Like when you asked me at the beginning mm -hmm. of the interview uh, I, uh, about music, and I said I, I always kind of knew that I was going to be doing music. So it's about really kind of releasing, releasing the illusions of who we think we are and reconnecting to who we are without illusions, without those belief systems. What are you here to do? What are you here to call to do right now? to assist yourself, to assist other people. And Shine kind of takes a combination of what, everything that we've talked about. So what would happen if we incorporated tuning, like we tune the bodies and the chakras, what if we incorporate those tuning forks within pop music? What if we incorporate some of those philosophies of ambient music, tones, beats per minute, entrainment, to really magnify um, the listener's experience, but at the same time, write songs that people can sing, yeah. you know, again. And really, it's, I, it's what I feel is the original blueprint of music was to take us to higher states of consciousness, to connect us to divinity, right? And why can't we do that and have fun? Why can't we do that and, and bring it into pop music? Mm -hmm. And that's really what it's about. And like, uh, for example, one of your tracks is uh, Love 444, which, which refers to tuning, I'm assuming, right? Mm -hmm. that it is. The A, which is normally 440, right? Exactly. Except yeah. you tuned to 444. What, um, can you claim the significance of that? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, for me, um, a lot of these triple number frequencies um, are geared towards... Yeah, can, well, let's explain exactly okay. what the numbers are because some people are probably like, 444, what is that? Because they don't understand the right. type of frequency. Right, so an A is normally tuned to A440. Right. Okay, but when we tune it to 444, okay, what happens is that all these triple number frequencies begin to show up on the keyboard in okay. equal, what's called equal interval tuning. So here's 444, right? Here's 222, and here's 111 in octaves. And if you go an octave above that, it goes to 888. So these triple number frequencies for me have always been... Um, I got received guidance through that. I don't know if you've ever woken up at 3.33 in the morning or 2.22. I do, but it's usually to pee. Well, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. And it, that's what, it might be that, but it might be something else as well. You know? <laughs> yeah. But it, it, what are the chances of waking up and seeing those numbers randomly you know, in the middle of the night? It's kind of like going to Vegas and, yeah, uh, it's and true. pulling yeah. three strawberries. You know? So these triple number frequencies geared towards alignment. You know, something is aligned at that moment. You know, when we're looking at 333 or 444 or 222, something's trying to get our and attention. And when did you release this on? 111111. Uh, 11, 11, 11. <sighs> yeah, 11, 11, 11. Yeah, and so you, it was you all... felt guided to, you needed that synchronicity or that, that the, you know, the numbers? It was, is that why? It was all part of it. Yeah, it's all part of it. And I believe that, you know, working with alignment, just like we're aligning our chakras, that we're fine tuning ourselves. You know, we're constantly fine tuning. So, you know, just bringing it up that slight increment, does that, does that change it very subtly? You know, and that's what vibration is about. Mm. You know, shifting our, our frequency, raising our vibration just a little bit, right, from 440 to 444. You know, the, the, our uh, planet's energy and frequency is, are, is being raised as well. You know, uh, there's something called the Schumann resonance, which is actually the vibration that the, the planet is vibrating at. Which, yeah, I've heard about this. Yeah, yeah, which w was originally about 7.8 hertz, but is rising, and it's risen almost four hertz. So, sh should we be rising with it? Uh -huh. Right? How are we affected when a planet's frequencies change, even though we can't hear them? Right? Are we affected by subtle frequency changes? And and we are. So I believe that uh, we shouldn't be held to one attunement. Why are we all tuned to A440? True. It's random. It was random. I, I noticed another track on here, um, Om Shalom Home. Did you mean to do to rhyme that like that? It's 
Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, for me, everything on the album had an intention. Mm -hmm. So Om Shalom Hom is based on seed syllables. Um, and the Om, and the, the word Om is said to contain every sound in the universe within that one sound. It ties us all together. It's called seed syllables. It weaves through many different languages. So you have Om, if I'm in Sanskrit, Shalom, right, in Hebrew, which is um, peace within, or hello, goodbyes, and home, which in our language is our heart. So it actually works with all three of those, bringing those cultures and diversity together. And it was actually shown in a, in a recent study through MRIs that chanting Om actually created what's called a limbic deactivation. It lit up certain areas of the brain which take us to a state of peacefulness or uh, calmness, a place where we're, we're safe. I did not do this study, but I got to present it in front of 200 doctors you know, at a, at a medical conference. And I think that's where we're going to now is, is that people, you know, science is meeting spirituality. We're at an exciting time where people are looking for additional tools out of traditional healthcare. The footprint that I want to leave is about the heart, bringing in awareness that people have a lot more power within their own hearts than they realize, and a lot more intelligence within their own hearts. We spend most of our lives trying to protect ourselves and protect the heart, as opposed to opening our hearts up. And for me, music is a perfect way of doing that because it does it without you know, us knowing it. It catches us off guard and just allows us to tap back into our heart's energy. So it would be my hope that the music that I'm leaving behind would be felt long after, you know, my passing and even listening to that, you know, would bring people to that space of being able to expand their heart just a little bit more, tapping into our potential of compassion and love. We are all capable of. That's what's most important to me. Barry Goldstein, a man whose music is used as a catalyst to open the heart feed the mind, nourish the soul, and assist our bodies in moving back to our natural state of health. A man whose music of the heart reminds us all, once again, it's the simple things in life that are what matter most. Namaste. Ha, 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 ha.